hello and welcome everybody. I'm Karen Eggleston. I'm going to welcome you to this webinar of Bringing AI from Code to Clinic. We're delighted today from this team from Google Health to share their perspectives on what it takes to bring a medical AI product from Code to Clinic in Southeast Asia and beyond. There are bio sketches on our website, so I'll just briefly introduce them here. Arisha Tawari is PhD in Molecular Biology Program Manager at Google Health. Uh, Sunny Romani, a biomedical engineer by training, is a product manager with the Health AI Group. And Raja Shansani, whose background is more in computer sciences, focuses on strategic partnerships in the public private sector in the Asia Pacific region. So we're looking forward to their presentation. If you have questions along the way, please put those in the Q&A and we'll pause a few times or get to them at the end. So please take it away. We look forward to your presentation. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, please uh, raise your hand. Um, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you guys who have taken the time uh, from your busy schedules to come over and uh, join us for this webinar. And thank you to the organizers, Karen and Lisa, for, for inviting us to speak to you all. Um, so uh, I'm a product manager at Google in the health AI research space, as, uh, as Karen just mentioned. Uh, and along with my colleagues, Richa and Raj, who are also joining us actually from Singapore early in the morning. Uh, we will, uh, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves shortly, but we will walk you through the work we have done in the past decade in bringing an amazing technology in the field of AI from code to clinic. Uh, we will touch upon some key milestones and the insights that we learned related to that in the form of some myths and realities. So it so keeps it very entertaining. Uh, I want to note that if you um, decided to attend this seminar or webinar, hoping that we will talk about generative AI or large language models, uh, you will then be disappointed for sure, uh, because we're not going to talk much about that or at all. Uh, but before I dive further into the deck, I will invite Richa and Raj to quickly introduce themselves. Go ahead, Richa. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. My name is Richa, and I'm a program manager at Google. Um, I have a PhD in molecular biology, and I worked in pharma for several years before I joined big tech. Um, and now at Google Health, actually, I work with a multidisciplinary team of engineers, clinicians, and researchers to develop AI solutions in healthcare and translate them into real-world applications, which is precisely what we're going to delve into today. So I look forward to talking to you guys about that. Uh, over to you, Raj. Thank you, Prisha and Sunny, and thanks again, Lisa and Karen, for setting this up. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Raj. Um, as Karen said, background in computer science, but uh, a career in management consulting and then partnerships focused on, on building healthcare partnerships from the ground up in the last half a decade or so. Um, so looking forward to sharing a little more about you know, the journey we've gone through um, to bring this AI from code to clinic. Um, you know, specifically the kind of partners we've had to work with or we've built relationships with and uh, and how those, you know, partnerships have led to certain outcomes and milestones along the way that have been critical to um, the product development lifecycle and are continuing to be critical as we think about um, creating, you know, population scale impact with uh, AI in healthcare. So looking forward to sharing that with all of you and thanks again for joining the webinar. Over to you, Sunny. Thanks, Raj. All right, so Richa, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, what we want to start by talking about is, um, as you all know, AI has been shown to have a huge potential for many different kinds of applications. Uh, and this includes many healthcare challenges. Uh, for example, in eye disease, in skin cancer, in breast cancer, there's people have done a ton of work at this point over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and the best part about this technology is that it works in the hands of not just researchers, research scientists, but also undergraduates, business owners, and even high school students. Um, the one example that you see on the right of a, of a high school student named Abu, he has an amazing story. If you guys ever have a chance to read about it, happy to share that story. Uh, he actually just used many of our open source tools that we had provided um, and built an algorithm for breast cancer detection uh, using AI. And, and he's been able to actually get that deployed in several places. So it's it's like amazing stories where, where this is not just limited to people who have done a very professional training in, in AI. Next slide. Um, so as, as what I just talked about, of course, it, it, many people can work on it, but in recent years, and almost not recent years now, this graph actually talks about since 2010, we've seen a huge increase in the number of papers uh, at the intersection of deep learning or machine learning and healthcare. 
Um, given the adoption of deep learning based technologies in consumer products, for example, Google Photos or, or email or anything like that, uh, these have been like really exciting case studies. Um, and one would expect that as much as there has been translation into products on the consumer side, we would have seen many AI enabled products in the healthcare space too. And don't get me wrong, we have seen some. However, we have definitely noticed that the translation from the code or from the algorithms in AI space to products has been very, very slow. So we want to talk about why that is. Next slide. And help you also figure out uh, um, how, how we, whatever, whatever we have learned from our experience, how can we leverage that uh, that we have done to translate a deep learning model for diabetic retinopathy particularly, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, folks who, who don't know about diabetic retinopathy, uh, and how that model is actually taken from code into clinical practices, and share with you the lessons that we have learned while doing so. Our hope in this case is that these insights will help folks who are considering starting off or already are on that kind of a similar journey. Next slide. Actually, we can, we can go on to the next one after that. Uh, so diabetic retinopathy, as many of you probably already know, is a manifestation of diabetes in your eyes. Uh, there are microvascular changes that can happen in our retina, which is the back part of the eye. Uh, and this is very common if the diabetes in patients is not managed well, especially if it has occurred for years. Uh, diabetes is even more prevalent in countries like India and Thailand and some of the other APAC countries. Uh, we will be talking about an AI solution that enables automated screening and early detection of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, this is something because it's AI, it provides instantaneous results. Uh, the accuracy of this model is pretty much on par with eye specialists. Uh, it is a medical device, so we have had to work through uh, many of the regulatory bodies to clear its use. Uh, which has allowed us so far to screen close to 400,000 patients globally along with our partners. Next slide. The, the key point to note here is that diabetic retinopathy is an entirely preventable condition. Um, through regular screenings, patient can receive an early diagnosis and interventions for, the, for, uh, for this cost-effective prevention of irreversible blindness from diabetic retinopathy. However, one of the challenges faced in many countries, including those in the APAC region, which is what we're going to talk about today, is the shortage of trained clinicians for diabetic retinopathy screening. Uh, these have to be ophthalmologists trained in pattern recognition of, of, uh, of uh, these retinal images. And with the rising incidence of diabetic retinopathy, combined with the limited healthcare resources and doctors and nurses, the problem of patient access to this expert care is very real. Um, this, is, this is something that has existed for a long time, and it is in this context that AI can demonstrate great potential. It was almost like a slam dunk application for AI, and AI-based screening, uh, we have seen, it improves access, it can reduce cost, and has the potential to improve the outcomes. Next slide. So this has been a pretty long journey and required a lot of patience and working through a lot of challenges. And thinking through each of these steps, uh, since there was no precedence or any kind of playbook for bringing AI-based medical devices to clinic, uh, we started off uh, with proving a concept that AI can actually work really well for an application for like diabetic retinopathy screening. Uh, we published this paper, the work was done in 2014, 2015, and then the paper was published in 2016 in JAMA. Uh, the impact of this work was huge, and it actually ended up getting selected as JAMA's paper of the decade for the last decade. Um, we went through the challenging tasks of validating the model then in the 2017 to 2019 timeframe. We wanted to make sure that whatever we built in the lab is actually working in the clinics, and it generalizes on population uh, for example, in Thailand, where we didn't have any data in our training set, does it actually work in, uh, in people from the Thai population? Uh, we then followed up with human-centered research to see how it could be integrated into the clinical practice. And now we are towards, like, I want to say the final stages. We were trying to figure out how to have a sustainable impact uh, in the longer term. Next slide. Um, so yeah, this has helped us learn a lot of lessons. And we have debunked some of the myths, which we will unpack one at a time. 
But uh, here I just wanted to note that we have also published this work, uh, which is like the lessons learned in, um, uh, from, from all of this work in Nature Medicine, and the citation is provided at the bottom. So if you ever want to read further about it, please feel free to do so. Um, next slide, please. So the way we think about this work is like there are five common myths that uh, we will introduce uh, over the next few slides. Uh, I will cover the, the first one, which is more data is all you need for, better, for a better model. And I'll then pass it on to Richa and Raj to walk through the rest of that. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, the, the first myth, which is more about, hey, is more when you're building these algorithm on, algorithms uh, for machine learning, uh, if you have enough data, and what is that enough data? We'll talk about that a little bit too. But is that all you really need? Or is there something more than that? And I think the conclusion by the by the next few slides you are going to figure out is it's not just about the quantity of the data, but it's also about the quality of the data. So I'm going to take a couple of slides or uh, figures from the initial JAMA paper that we published. Next slide. So um, like I said earlier, when you were looking at the timeline, a few years ago, we set out to see if we could train a model to classify fundus images or retinal images, as you might know, for diabetic retinopathy. This is, as you can see on the right, it needs to be categorized into uh, these, these five different levels for diabetic retinopathy, and there is other things like diabetic macular edema, and, and maybe some of the uh, characteristics of the image itself, like, um, like is the image gradable or not, or how is the image quality? So what we did is we started with 130,000 images and worked with about 54 different ophthalmologists, the experts in this field, to produce about 880,000 labels. Um, I want to clarify, when we, when we say labels throughout this presentation, it's actually talking about ground truth diagnosis. Uh, so uh, this is ophthalmologists looking at these images and, and categorizing them manually and agreeing or disagreeing with each other to see if the final result could be the ground truth. Uh, so what we did is after we had these 880,000 different labels and 130,000 images, we trained a model um, using the existing convolutional neural network architecture, the inception network. Hopefully folks who have uh, done any kind of architecture work in AI are aware of this already. And produced we, we produced a fairly accurate model, one whose performance actually rivaled that of the ophthalmologist. And we reported these results, like I was saying earlier, in the JAMA paper. But there are a couple of different figures in this paper that I want to talk about, which will help us get through the, the first myth. Uh, next slide, Richa. So a particularly useful figure in this paper that really didn't get much attention is, is the one that you are looking at this slide. Uh, what we did is we tested how a data set size and the number of labels affect the algorithm performance. Uh, and what we found here is, uh, which I'll, I'll go into more detail in the next few slides, is that while in general more data is better, uh, high quality data and the efficient labeling strategy is the key here. So let's unpack that by one, one by one. So first I'm going to look at the left image. Uh, next slide, Richa. As you'll see in this panel A, uh, we look at how the algorithm is performing. Uh, by varying the number of images in, in the data set. So as you can see, we started with like very few images in hundreds, and then we can, kept on going to um, higher and higher images, reaching all the way to 100,000 images in the future, or in, uh, towards the right side of the, of the, car, uh, of the chart. Uh, as you can see, performance is on the y-axis, and the number of images we are using are on the x-axis. Each of these dots represent a different algorithm that was trained on a data set of varying sizes. Um, as you can see, the performance uh, plateaus around 50 to 60,000 images. This means that for any uh, that for a particular problem, which is similar to this one where you're trying to train classify between five different grades, a training data set of about 50 to 60,000 image, images that are well labeled uh, could give you an algorithm with similar performance. This is this also means that similar types of problem in the future, a data set of this size would be a good starting point, but it doesn't mean it's, it's uh, always going to work and will depend on the problem that you're facing. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the right panel that I was showing earlier. Uh, here what we do is we measure the performance compared to the number of grades that are, in, that are available for each of the images. As I was saying, we had 130,000 images, but we had about 880,000 labels. So the development data set had an average of about four and a half labels per image. This was because multiple opinions from several doctors provided a better ground truth than an, than an opinion of just one doctor. Uh, so what we wanted to find out was 
what happened? What would happen if the algorithm performance had noisy or imperfect labels uh, for each part of the development set? So using the full data set, we trained models that used only a subsample of labels for either the training or the tune set. And what we realize is decreasing the number of labels, as you can see the, uh, the graph on the right, the, uh, the top line, which is the training set, when we decrease the number of labels on the training set, it really had very little impact on the overall performance of the algorithm. However, the algorithm performance does depend quite a bit on the accuracy of the labels in the tune set. Um, so, the, and as you can see, like the performance really uh, took, took a nosedive when it was only a single label that was provided in the tune set. So the takeaway here is given limited resources, invest in labeling the tune set in as high quality labels as possible. So that kind of like just brings us back that it's not just about the qual the number of images that you have or the number the, the size of the data set. It's also about the quality of the labels and where you apply, if you have limited resources, where you apply those resources. Um, and with that, I will uh, let's let's talk about the next uh, myth and I'll pass it on to Richa. Take it away, Richa. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sunny. So the next myth is that all you need are AI experts to be able to build and translate an AI model. However, the reality is that it really takes a village of multidisciplinary experts to build a well-functioning and translatable AI system. And I'll tell you what I mean. Here we can see that indeed expertise across many areas is critical to medical AI development. AI experts are needed to develop and tune the model so that it achieves accuracies that would be suitable for real world clinical use. Clinicians are also critical in defining what the AI model should predict so that it meets goals that are of clinical relevance. We also need to consider having regulatory experts who can help us understand the process and nuances of regulatory laws and practices. And similarly, expertise in user experience, ethics, health equity, legal product development, these are all important as well to ensure that the AI models are designed responsibly with human safety and usability in mind. And I'll just give you uh, an example that kind of lends a flavor as to how all of these different functions come together. So initially, when we were developing our AI model, it was designed such that it would provide um, a circling of the areas of the eye that were affected by diabetic eye disease, specifically just certain spots in the eye. And when we discussed and talked about this with our clinicians in-house, as well as external experts, what we realized was that that was not really clinically useful as much as if we were to provide an actual grading of the, of the eye. And so that's where we pivoted from being able to think about, okay, it's not really just about circling affected areas, but actually being able to provide a diagnosis of sorts that provides the severity of the diabetic eye disease. And then in doing so, this is where our regulatory experts came in, where, they in, in, where we learn about the implications of what it means when something like this provides a diagnosis going into the area of medical device and what are the implications for that. And um, just earlier on, Sunny was talking about the data sets that were involved from having spoken to our ethics and the health equity teams. We learned about how it's important to include data sets that represent different populations so that we have a model that is, that is trained on diverse patient population, diverse patient data sets, and is able to be generalizable across um, a wide, a broad range of uh, different population groups. So those just kind of gives you a flavor for how different areas come in to be able to all come together for building a medical AI product. So the next two myths I'll tackle together. Um, so there's this notion that a strong AI performance is sufficient for turning a model into a successful product in market. The fact is AI performance in the lab alone does not necessarily guarantee its performance in real life. Careful validations and real world testing are super important um, and are really essential to ensure that the model translates in clinical workflows and importantly, builds trust and confidence in the user. It's also equally important to ensure that we design AI around humans 
And that's what we mean when we will refer to the term human-centered AI. What we mean by that is building AI to fit and integrate with the user and their workflows in a way that is seamless and, and not disruptive. So this slide here is really to give you a snapshot where I as a program manager come in. As a program manager, I'm responsible for ensuring that as a team, we're working successfully towards the various stages of AI development to deployment in clinics, staying within timelines and also mitigating any risks that might arise along the way. And this really diagram shows you the stages that are involved for real world implementation of our model and the level of planning and effort that goes in from pre-deployment evaluation that includes user research and field visits to deployment and iterative testing that happens in that process to post-deployment activities. And I'll speak to all of this in just a few moments. So when we set off designing our product, we knew that the use case was going to be in settings with resource constraints and places there that might have a shortage of doctors. And indeed, where countries were in, in countries where we deployed, specifically, we're talking about India and Thailand in this context here, our model was deployed across different environments, from rural screening centers to those that were more in urban settings, and even population, uh, even in uh, mobile screening settings. So this image that you're seeing on the right-hand side, the rightmost image, where you see this black kind of column here, what that is, is actually, this was a mobile screening setting where diabetes patients were being imaged, um, getting their image, retinal images taken. But because a dark screening setting is most optimal to getting, to getting the, the right images taken, you have to create a, sort of a dark, sort of dark setting or low light settings. And so this dark cloth here was to just kind of envelop the patient and create this dark low light setting so that you can take the most optimal image. And these are some of the, I guess you could say, quote unquote, hacks and, and, and ways that, um, you know, the, the healthcare professionals and, 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 and locals on the ground would find ways to ensure that no matter where they're screening, they're finding ways to optimize on taking appropriate images, images that are inter interpretable by clinicians as well as by the AI. And so all of these, you know, across, as you see, there was these various different settings that we had to think about. And it was important to demonstrate the performance of our AI across all of these settings and ensuring a human-centered approach to integrating them. And so we worked with um, HCI experts, or you can say human computer interaction experts and user researchers to understand the feasibility of using AI within the screening program. And so this included mapping out each step of the patient's journey from the time they enter the clinic to when they from the time that they leave the clinic and how you get them referred back in. So the diagram that you hear that you see here on the on the on the slide uh, really is a, a kind of a snapshot of the way we work with our team of researchers to map out every step of that journey here and just thinking through identifying where the potential efficiencies would be, where would be the potential bottlenecks as we implemented our software. And we published our methodology in one of the papers in HCI proceedings, which we're happy to share across later. But this just gives you an idea that of how it's not only important to think about product functionality, but about how we design workflows around these products to maximize on their potential. And so here you can see that these images were taken from the early stages of our pre-deployment where we worked with our, uh, our team of multidisciplinary experts to do conduct field visits and user research to really understand what were the requirements on the ground? What were the constraints on the ground? What were the resources that were available? And thinking through that and identifying how we can best place our product to be integrated seamlessly into user workflows. Uh, we also conducted participatory design workshops. Um, this picture on the right here is with the uh, a team of nurses and uh, technicians that were really the end user and conduct the screenings on the ground and engaging with them to help them think through how for the first time as we introduce AI into their settings, how we can ensure that it's um, done so in the most optimal way and in the least disruptive way possible. And these kinds of workshops not only played a role in helping us think about how we can successfully bring our product to clinical settings, but also really helps to identify our local champions on the ground and helps us to really engage the end user, i.e. the nurses, 
to ensure that they are able to embrace this and are fully fully bought in. And all of this all goes, you know, plays along, goes a long way in ensuring and building user trust. And so having done what I showed you before, which was done all the pre-work and the pre-deployment research and understanding and laying the foundation on the ground, the next step was really then to launch and, and pilot our AI in real world clinical settings. And this is giving you a snapshot of what we did in Thailand specifically, where Thailand has a national screening program, which uh, tackles about 4.5 million diabetics. And we launched at five, sorry, nine different clinics across the country in our first stage uh, within the national screening program. And uh, almost 8,000 patients were screened across three different provinces. And in doing so over the course of the year where this program, this prospective study was run, we were able to demonstrate feasibility of deploying this in real world clinical settings. And this was really the first large scale demonstration of any AI application uh, of medical AI being used on the ground. And as a result of this, we were able to gain really valuable insights on what it takes to bring AI in, in actual clinical workflows and gain insights on what it would take if you were to think about scaling uh, an AI product even further from nine to countrywide, if you were to imagine doing that. And along the way, it's not about just deploying and feeling like the work is done. Along the way, it's critical to maintain and monitor progress. And we did that through creating internal dashboards for tracking how many screenings were being done, how many cases of, you know, uh, visually, you know, uh, um, patients who were at risk of uh, 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 visual vision loss, how many of those did we detect, how many patients we pre prevented from potential blindness. Uh, and being able to monitor that was really important. And also even monitoring for how many images were actually gradable by the AI versus deemed ungradable. All of these metrics were important for us to be able to understand how effective the AI was being on in, in the clinical uh, program and also was important in ensuring that we are providing value back to the actual uh, clinicians who are using this within their screening settings. What I showed you previously was what we did in progress, but then there's also an element of thinking through what happens when you're, you know, when you've launched your product and it's out into the real world and now you're looking at beyond test bed settings. How do we ensure that we are proactively monitoring the performance of AI when it's out in market, in real world use as a regulated medical product in use? And this gathering of clinical evidence, assessing clinical fit and providing transparency are all part of product success. And for us, as we were thinking through this, we wanted to be ensure that we were being very intentional in the way we were monitoring the product um, once it's out there in the market. And thinking through how monitoring should be built in rather than an afterthought. And so the insight that we gleaned from being proactive uh, rather than being active were very valuable because we realized that you know, in doing so, not only A, are you setting best practices and demonstrating in the industry what are considered um, best practices, but you're also able to cre create this process of um, continuous uh, improvement for your product along the way. And so to give you a, you know, a more concrete example of what I mean by that, just walking you through here uh, of what we did with our diabetic eye disease, uh, our tool for this, what we did was initially from our um, retrospective and validation that we had conducted in the clinic, in, sorry, in the, in the lab before we actually launched, looking at pre-market, you can see that uh, we had a performance that was um, very robust. We had a for referable diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema, which is what our AI um, product uh, diagnosis, we had very strong uh, sensitivity and specificity. And then as part of post-market monitoring over the, you know, the next couple of years, we continue to evaluate. And we, what we found that was that in the EU and India, where it is actually being launched and being used, the, the performance uh, of the AI continued to remain very strong and very robust even in post-market stages, um, and in some cases, even better than what we had seen previously in the pre-market stages. So this, this was gave us assurance that we are continuing to provide um, and uh, offer an AI product that is continuing to perform well and is, is useful um, 
well beyond the early stages of when we had conducted those really in-depth user studies. And so with that, um, I will just end my section by sharing that not only is it important to continue to look at our product, but obviously understanding that the end user is essentially the has a final say and, and is a final sort of um, yay or nay as to whether this is being effective in their settings. And so we conducted a lot of qualitative user surveys for, to understand user sentiments, essentially from the nurses and, and the nurse assistants who were running the screening program. And uh, you know we found out that very early on, the nurses, even though they were using the AI for the first time, understood and grasped the value of what AI can bring to their settings. And these are just some of the quotes that we gathered from some of our interviews and some of our surveys where they, they, we talk, where they highlight the fact that AI allowed task shifting so that it freezes up, frees up some of their time to focus on other areas of patient care, how AI is able to provide diagnosis much faster than it would have normally, shortening time from a patient getting diagnosis from weeks to minutes, and how AI sensitivity is able to catch things which uh, human eye may not be able to. So this was very, uh, very great to see and also just gave us assurance that we have built the right user trust and confidence along the way. Um, and with I will pause and um, see if there's any questions. Otherwise, I will, you know, have pass it over to Raj. And Sunny, you were just saying something. Yeah, I was. I was just going to say there. Uh, there are a couple of questions that might be worth addressing. One of them, I think Raj said he might address is part of his chat. Uh, I can take the other one, um, which is from Victor. Uh, how do you think about the necessity and frequency for model training? For example, did you have to retrain province by province? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Victor. Uh, I think our goal from the get-go was to be able to build a model uh, which uh, encompasses enough variability um, in in race, in ethnicity, in age, in gender, um, and and geographies, uh, all these different kinds of things. Um, and uh, which, which requires the data set to be quite large. Um, however, um, what we also did is since we, we possibly cannot uh, cover every, every possible variation in, uh, in the training set itself, um, before we go deploy anywhere or before we go seek regulatory clearance, uh, we check if the model actually gener a model which is trained on a data set, let's say from US and EU and maybe some parts of India, does that generalize well uh, in, in Thailand or not? Um, and some of those, the, the model actually had enough variation that it generalized really, really well for, for countries like Thailand. Um, and we didn't have the necessity to retrain the model. Um, however, there could be other variables. For example, there could be new cameras in the market too, uh, which have enough variability in the type of the images that they generate. Usually these cameras um, produce very similar images, but there could be, sometimes be, uh, be a necessity to, to at least test out what these new cameras um, produce as images and, and is the model really working well um, with those kinds of images too. If not, and if before, uh, I believe like before you deploy with any kind of camera, which is very different from the existing cameras, uh, it might be worth testing this. Um, and validating it that it's actually generalizing for different models, different kinds of operators uh, uh, before we deploy. And if there's a need for uh, retraining, then, then you go ahead and do, do the retraining. But usually when a model is trained on a strong data set like this, the retraining part could just be, hey, maybe you just need to retune. Maybe you just need to set the operating point differently. Um, but, but so far, that hasn't been our experience that we had to change something significantly. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sunny, and thanks, Richard. So I think uh, on the last myth to reality, the, the, the focus from our side is how do you convert all of this work that Sunny and Richard have talked about um, into success? And the first question that comes to mind naturally is what does it mean uh, to be successful um, in, in this particular context? And from our side, at least, the successful benchmark is to catalyze the adoption of human-centered AI in healthcare. And necessarily, that's not a one company endeavor. You know, no one company can or should be able to do that alone. Um, so, when you're thinking about catalyzing the adoption of AI in healthcare, you require partnerships across the spectrum you know, from research, academia, startups, and you know, tech implementers, all the way to governments and regulators. 
um, that are thinking through the spectrum of policy, of technology, of implementation, um, all the way to the to the clinic that's actually going to be using this kind of workflow, and the nurses and the doctors who are actually going to be part of that journey, and the patient who you know ultimately experiences this process. So, um, you know, all of this requires effective, long-term, mutually beneficial partnerships, and and that's what um, you know I'll focus on in my section. So, if you could go to the next slide, Richard, I'll just. Um, I just you know briefly talk a little bit about the different types of partners that we've worked with along this journey. I think as Sunny mentioned at the top of the um, webinar, we it has been a ten-year journey, um, and you know in that ten-year journey, you work with a lot of partners that are you know all the way from foundational, uh, you know when we when we built the initial data sets, sourcing the initial data sets for the model itself, uh, we worked with partners like Arvind Eye Care, Shankar Netrale, Narayan Netrale in India. Um, IPAC in the US, um, and then all the way to the extreme right of the spectrum, which is you know what we're calling graduation of this technology for long-term success, you know, success and sustainability. Uh, there's partnerships across the board, and I'll spend some time talking about each of them um, and and what we've done in those kinds of partnerships. So I think on the extreme left, like I said, we uh, you know we work with we work with partners who have foundational data sets, and again to make sure that. Um, you know, we ground the technology in real world use cases. Uh, we needed to make sure that uh, this is, you know, responsible, equitable, um, and it and it is safe to use. So we're working with partners who provided uh, diverse data sets that allowed the model to generalize, that allowed the model to be robust, that allowed the model to have um, enough representation of different, you know, pupil sizes, for example, or different ages of patients, different races, Sunny mentioned. Those are all partners that uh, we worked with to source high quality de-identified data. Um, and then once that sort of early model was developed, and then Sunny also explained in length about you know, the labeling and adjudication, which again was a partnership with the medical community. Uh, there's a lot of trust involved in building partnerships in that space when there's a there's a natural tendency to think about AI as a you know slightly ambiguous, nebulous, nefarious entity, which isn't entirely um, explainable in some ways. So working with the medical community to first build trust around the process and then, you know, establish ground truth to help the models develop performance on par with ophthalmologists in this case, but radiologists, pathologists, you know, we work across the spectrum of um, healthcare. So those are partnerships that we worked on. Once the initial data sets are there, then you work on the ground truth and the validation partnerships. Um, and then once you have a model that you think is, you know, robust enough to be able to be field tested, um, Richard spent some time talking about these prospective and retrospective research um, partners who you know would take the model and uh, deploy that model first on let's say a, a retrospective data set that already exists just to be able to compare uh, how the model performs in a real world clinical setting. Uh, we talked about different lighting, we talked about different skill sets available for imaging technicians, we talked about different trainings available for nurses and for uh, medical practitioners. All of this influences the performance of the model in a real world workflow. Um, it's uh, it's a branch of research we call implementation research. It's not what you immediately think of when you think about research. You think of foundational research, applied research, but implementation research has been one of the biggest learnings along this way because uh, working with partners who have the ability to take your model and then actually build it into the workflow um, and then test out things like you know does the AI from a from a technical standpoint yes it performs on par. Uh, with an ophthalmologist, but is it adding uh, more steps to the workflow? Is it increasing um, the number of uh, you know steps that a that a nurse or a technician has to take, and therefore increasing the time of the entire interaction? Is it reducing that? What are the clinical uh, operational outcomes of success associated with AI in a clinical workflow? So those are partners that we work with uh, both in India and Thailand. Um, and then the technical side of the house, because we're building the models and we're building the foundational uh, capabilities here, but by no means are we building an end-to-end -end, um, you know, plug-and-play kind of solution that can just go into a clinic and work like magic. Um, so there's an ecosystem of technical partners that we work with, you know, front-end EMR, EHR providers, last-mile tech implementers, you know, companies that work with cameras, companies that work on cameras, companies that provide maintenance and troubleshooting of medical devices. They plug them in with the AI solutions. They connect that with patient records. Um, all of those you know, technical partnerships are critical to try and bring this AI to market. Um, so those are all, I would say, on the left-hand side of the spectrum, which uh, mentioned in the research section. And then uh, I think Jay's question was more on the middle side of the bucket, which was regulatory partners. So now, you know, regulatory and government partners. One of the most interesting nuances of working in this part of the world, um, you know, we're talking about India and Thailand, but I'm generalizing to 
uh, low resource or middle income, low and middle income countries, um, is that in many cases, the government and regulatory authorities have not been able to come up with a, a clear defined standard for how they're going to regulate software as a medical device or AI in healthcare. And this is, an, uh, this is not about Gen AI yet. It's even just in the traditional sense of the word AI in, in healthcare. There's a lack of, uh, you know, regulatory standards that have been established. So in some cases, working with the regulators and the governments as research partners to take them along the journey of clinical trials, validation, robustness is really helpful. Uh, we do rely on some benchmarks that are created by the US FDA or the European CE mark, for example, uh, to set some best practices, which can then help regulators in India, in Thailand, in APAC, um, come up with a set of comparable standards to regulate and govern how um, you know, AI would work in clinical practice. Um, but but basically, the, these kinds of partnerships require us to, to work hand in glove um, and uh, essentially provide all sorts of documentation. When we're doing, when I mentioned, for example, retrospective or prospective research, we would submit that research proposal to the, let's say, Thai FDA or the Indian CDSEO. And we would bring those regulators along and explain, you know, the trial, the standard of care, what we're measuring, what kind of clinical outcomes, what kind of technical outcomes, um, you know, referral adherence, patient benchmarks, number of screenings, we'll talk about the metrics and we'll, we'll explain as much as we can that, you know, the, these models have been validated, tested, and they have, let's say, a C mark in this case, um, which will help the regulator then come up with a comparable policy that will help when you're deciding to apply for the local regulatory approvals as well. Um, so to answer Jay's question more directly, in some cases, the regulator will say, um, it's great that your model has you know, performed really well on a global data set, but I would like to see that performance um, on my local representative data sets. And so when Richard went through that example of the, the clinical trial um, that we did in Thailand with you know, nine different hospitals, that was a really significant body of evidence for the local regulator to, to see how the model performs and generalizes for the Thai population. And likewise for India with the CDSEO. Um, when we think about launching this in an early access or in even in a deployment format, these kinds of partnerships with government and regulatory become critical. One thing just to share here is I am lumping a lot of different agencies and partners within the government space. Um, just to give a snapshot, in, in the Thai context, government means um, the Department of Medical Services. There's an eye services committee that actually runs the screening programs. Um, there is a, you know, an agency called the National Health Security Office, which thinks about reimbursements and health coverage. Uh, there's the Thai FDA, obviously the regulatory authority. There's an agency called HITAP that does pricing and cost utility assessment. So there's lots and lots of different partners, even within the government space, that all need to come together. I think Richard mentioned that it takes a village inside of Google to, to work on these products. It also takes a village outside. Um, to bring these products to market. So those are the two big buckets that we've been working on um, over the last sort of seven to 10 years. But what we're doing increasingly in 2024 and beyond is working with partners for what we call graduation. And graduation means to be able to set this up for long-term success. Uh, you really need to create an ecosystem um, that can be you know, commercially viable naturally for the partners who are in this space. It can be long-term success. Um, it can actually positively impact the clinical indicators at a population scale to ultimately basically create the foundation for what AI can do in healthcare. Uh, if you move to the next slide, Richard, it's just a timeline representation of, um, you know, of the certain, of the milestones that we've talked about, Sunny and Richard have talked about, but basically um, the partners we work with along the journey, this is not representative or complete. Uh, a lot of these partners have worked with us across a spectrum of many different steps. Um, but just to show the long-term nature of these relationships, and, and this is not just for our work in ophthalmology, uh, a lot of these partners are, you know, not just for our work in diabetic retinopathy, a lot of these partners are working with us across different modalities and eye diseases, um, you know, when it comes to the government regulators, we're also working with them on things like breast cancer screening or radiotherapy or pathology or dermatology. So lots of interesting applications of AI in healthcare and these partners are with us across that sort of spectrum. Um, so that was you know, just as a representation, these partners, uh, you know, various different partners from India, from Thailand, um, regulators, research partners, technical partners, the steps here kind of illustrate how the journey, you know, with these partners goes and how, you know, we have to continue to work uh, with partners to, to bring this to market. If you uh, go to the next slide, which I'll just quickly um, cover. Yeah, so just, just to sort of demonstrate population scale impact, which is one of the guiding principles for us in, in Google research and health AI. 
um, you know, through all of these partners and and working with the regulators and government agencies, we've been able to come to a point where, um, you know, we I think Sunny mentioned at the top of the webinar, we've done about 400,000 screenings um, live, and that is that is a significant milestone, and we don't take that for granted. That's the you know, if you look on the left hand side with with Thailand with Rajavati Hospital and the Department of Medical Services, we've done in Thailand we've done the largest you know interventional study for AI in healthcare. It was a it was a country milestone that was acknowledged and recognized all the way up uh, with the Thai you know, government. And we demonstrated the feasibility of deploying this in the national screening program. What does this mean? It's now created a set of goals within the country's charter called the National Innovation KPIs, which have a section specifically dedicated to diabetic retinopathy and to increasing that screening, AI-enabled screening. Um, across the entire diabetic or suspected diabetic population in Thailand. So that's that's an example of you know impact on the left hand side of the spectrum. And then in India, you know as we know the population in India is uh, is vast and diverse. And as a federated healthcare architecture, um, we work across partners who are then able to cover different regions. And Arvindai Hospital is is a worthy one to mention because they um, they are the largest eye care facility in the world uh, in terms of number of you know surgeries and screenings they perform. They work across. I think they do about 10% of all eye care services um, across you know low and middle income countries. And with them, we've been able to scale uh, across you know more than 80 different locations, over 250,000 patients. And Arvind's mandate is um, to solve blindness and to work as a as mostly as a not for profit. So really aligns with the mission of population scale impact and research. So um, again, these are the kind of partners that have been with us all the way from the foundational data sets to testing the product and now early access and then beyond. Um, so it's it's really rewarding to see these partners with us across the journey and then you know moving forward as well. Uh, if you move to the next slide, Richard, I can just quickly cover and I'm just cognizant that we should wrap up quickly for questions. Uh, the next slide just talks a little bit more about what it means to have success long term. You know, what are the go to market considerations that you know we and our partners and the government and these sort of tech startups I mentioned, what do they need to take into account? So one was obviously um, AI needs to have an impact, um, you know, beyond just the technology itself in the clinical workflow. You know, once you detect a, let's say if AI is really successful at screening a higher number of patients or detecting a higher number of vision threatening cases, what happens to the healthcare system? Does it have the capacity to be able to handle those increased positive cases? Um, you know, how do you then make sure that patients actually are adhering to the referral uh, and not just getting a positive flag and ignoring it, for example? So what are the system changes that need to happen there? Um, health economics and outcomes research. What is the cost utility of AI in healthcare? Like I mentioned, does it add more steps? Does it reduce them? What is the overall cost benefit? Um, and then graduation partner capabilities. Do they have the ability to take this to a long-term um, you know, success. And I think Victor had a question about, you know, retraining the bottle. And then there are lots of situations that come up, you know, Sunny mentioned different camera types. There could be different types of populations, different age groups, um, different kinds of, you know, pupil sizes. There's lots of different considerations and that might require retraining. Um, does the partner have the ability to do that long term? Um, I'll just end with one slide that, uh, uh, you know, talks a little bit just about the cost effectiveness and utility. Uh, Richard, if you could just move to the next slide. Uh, we just wanted to show you how this research is evolving in, in our part of the world. Um, two different, you know, research papers that talk about this, one from Singapore, one from Thailand, both measuring the effectiveness of AI in diabetic retinopathy screening for low and middle income countries. Um, interestingly, the Singapore research paper, uh, you know, actually evaluated three scenarios, you know, current workflow, AI only, and then sort of a semi-automated workflow, which is AI plus, uh, plus manual. And it turns out that from that evaluation, the semi-automated workflow was the most cost efficient. Um, you know, in Thailand, when we did the analysis, uh, we found that AI was really, really effective in terms of the cost benefit that it provided. And these papers are linked here if anyone wants to read further. But uh, the interesting dynamic to consider is the, the cost of human labor is quite cheap in countries like India and Thailand. Um, so the inherent value of AI may not be as high as you might expect in, in, in the US or in some of the Western developed markets. So how do you then, considering that sort of low cost of human labor, um, how do you then consider the, the economic impact of AI in healthcare? Is it adding as much value? Um, is it creating, you know, additional steps? Um, and, you know, it's great to see this additional research starting to happen around cost utility. And we expect that this will be uh, the starting point of more sort of go to market and business models around AI and healthcare. So with that, I will stop and um, 
you know, pause for questions. I don't know if there were any that came to me uh, during the during my part, but otherwise I'm happy to open it up to a general Q&A. I tried to answer most of them in the Q&A section itself, but um, I left one, which, uh, Richa, if you want to address that, um, uh, it was something about at the implementation stage, what were some of the significant things that most surprised you to handle them? Did that require another set of disciplines and people? Well, that's a great question. I was actually just in the process of typing in an answer, and I thought maybe it's easier just to have a discussion around this. Uh, it's a great question because uh, we definitely had a lot of uh, learnings along the way. And some of the areas that were, you know, the, I guess I would say that there were two categories in which we had some interesting learnings. One is, falls in the category, category of what we can do from an from a organization or company standpoint versus areas which fall more in the category of what the clinical workflow or the healthcare professionals need to think about. So to be more precise, some of the things that we learned was that, you know, where when during eye screenings, it's important to have dim lit set settings so that your pupils are more open and you're able to take a much higher quality picture. And so what we were seeing in the early stages was that some of the um, clinics and some of the sites were having really uh, poor images being um, uh, uploaded for AI to interpret. And so when we got down to the bottom of it, you know, it was more about, okay, there's, there's more of an education and awareness uh, that needs to be brought in uh, to ensure that the AI workflow is optimized. So this would have happened even if it was a human grader, but if it's AI in the picture and you want to create the seamless workflow, the, the, the better the image quality, the better it will be for AI to be able to interpret accurately. And so this area was more about us just highlighting to the hospitals that you know th there is an area that needs to be considered with regards to um, bringing greater awareness and highlighting the importance of creating a more optimal conditions for image capture. And, and to that extent, we even actually played work with some of our UX researchers in-house to think about how can we create um, a situation where camera uh, technicians or nurses who are taking these images remember this and keep this top of mind. And we created some like, you know, user-friendly posters that had like sort of something that was uh, in the clinics itself that in, in encouraged the patient to be aligned in the camera the right way and for the image uh, technicians to be able to take the image, um, keeping the best optimal conditions in mind. So that's one area that, you know, we, we were really interested, was interesting. And um, the other thing that we also learned is that Obviously, this is an AI model that runs on, on or, you know, needs requires uh, internet connectivity to run. But what happens if you're in a situation where, uh, where in settings where maybe the internet connection is not that strong? How do we deal with that? And so that led to greater further discussions about thinking about in the future, if you want to think about creating an offline model that can be run in settings where internet connectivity may not be that strong, or ensuring that settings, you know, these hospitals or clinics, um, have these sort of uh, solutions like a pocket Wi-Fi or creating um, better internet connectivity if they are truly genuine, genuinely interested about having AI to be able to improve their um, clinical workflows. So that's, that was another area. So it's a combination of different things that are related to what we can affect versus what falls on the clinicians to be able to think about. I hope that answers. All right, and I think there is one more, actually two more now. Um, one from Satish, uh, will you be able to elaborate a bit on the model that resulted in the highest accuracy and what was done to optimize these CNN models? Uh, and finally, would these slides be available? I believe the slides or the recording would be available, but Karen or Lisa could probably answer that. Yes, that's correct, thank you. Okay, and uh, in terms of like um, the model that resulted in the highest accuracy, um, this is something I was referring to in one of the uh, answers I typed up. Um, as I was talking about earlier, that the, it's not just about more data, right? It's also about the quality of data. Um, after our initial paper, we actually did another one um, in 2018, which was all about, uh, all about um, what we learned as part of the labeling strategy or as part of creating these ground truth, which was an amazing learning in itself. And we, we usually cover it in, in a different slide deck. We, we just didn't have the time today. But the idea there was we were trying to figure out that um, how many uh, labels are needed per image to be able to get a very accurate diagnosis. And do we really need to just apply that um, to all of the training set, which could be 
for in some cases about a million images, in some cases about 100,000 images, but it gets very expensive to create um, these data sets. So we, what we did is uh, we figured out that the best possible ground truth you can get, or at least based on our research, and, and I'm sure there are other research that, that would conflict against this, but um, the idea here is when different, let's say there are three different doctors who are adjudicating the same, or who are labeling the same image, Raj, Richa, and myself, we are labeling the same image, and we will, uh, ophthalmologists actually disagree with each other a lot. So someone would be saying there is no diabetic retinopathy, and uh, the third person might be saying there is severe diabetic retinopathy in this case. Um, so because there is so much noise in these labels, we came up with um, a technique which is, which is very commonly known as adjudication, but uh, the way we did this adjudication is Every grader, for example, I will get to see what Raj and Richa have actually graded. And if there is differences between my grade and their grades, I get to change that grade or I get to ask questions to them about why they think this grade is, is valid. And then if, if we cannot do this asynchronously, we have a way to actually have a meeting about it and we can talk through some of the cases where we just couldn't agree. So I think it, th that kind of level of work uh, helped us create a very highly rich um, ground truth. Um, and we only use those for tuning set. And when we use that for tuning set, that is the model that actually gave the highest accuracy so far. So hopefully that answers. Um, yeah, could you imagine an unsupervised version with similar performance? Uh, yes, anything can be imagined right now, Victor, at this point. Uh, this, is, this is something for this particular application we haven't necessarily looked at, but I believe there are papers which talk about unsupervised version. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the performance of those though. Uh, but that's something people people look into, yeah. Um, I think that was it as far as live questions. Great. Well, thank you all so much. I thought I'd uh, ask a couple myself. Uh, you talked a lot about many of the steps. It's complicated. We could talk longer about it. But just digging into a little of the heterogeneity on the provider side, if you could share any insights there. For example, um, I think in one of the questions, Sunny said you could talk more about at the early stages if the MDs disagree when they're overfeeding or uh, how you dealt with that. Or later in the implementation stages, uh, you may know some of the other research in other areas finds that these AI-enabled tools boost the performance of the less experienced workers and not so much those are more experienced and enabling that task shifting. But do you find specific examples of heterogeneous uh, impacts on the providers in during when they integrated into their workflow. If you could comment on that, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great question. And Richard, feel free to jump in, um, uh, if, uh, Richard, Raj, anyone. Uh, I would say uh, the, the first part where you're asking, Karen, when, when ophthalmologists don't agree with each other, which is kind of what I was just explaining, that there is a process we follow to make sure that eventually they either just agree to disagree or they decide on a grade that could be used as the ground truth. Because at the end of the day, model cares about one result per image and, and it should be the richest possible, the most accurate. And the more graders you get and the more you get them to agree, of course it gives you a better ground truth. So, so that's the kind of adjudication methodology, both synchronous and asynchronous methods that we have used that helped us take care of that heterogeneity. The other thing that you talked about is um, I want to clarify, uh, the goal with this particular technology was to bring access to diabetic eye care uh, to people that don't have it today, which means that these folks don't even, these patients don't even have access to any kind of doctors, especially no eye doctors. So the idea is that we have trained a model, which is as good as, let's say, the eye specialist, can we take it all the way not directly to patients' home, but close to, we have something called vision centers in India, which is like rural, tiny clinics. If a camera could just be simply placed there, which they already have sometimes, this AI technology could bring that expert level of care. So these people don't have to travel all the way to the main cities in India or in Thailand to be able to get the same kind of care. So what we weren't really testing for is existing doctors, can, uh, which is ophthalmologist, and like you're saying, um, some some junior ones versus senior ones, does it actually up-level them? I am pretty sure that would help them do that, but that's not necessarily what we were test testing as part of the study. Uh, because again, if you give a junior person 
an expert level of care in their hands, that is definitely going to help them. So we, um, Richard, am I forgetting something? Have we tested any kind of assisted breeds here? Yeah. No, I think that that uh, captures it well. Um, you know, Karen, when I was talking about some of the the, the surveys and the feedbacks that we got from the nurses, you know, it, these are the nurses who, like I said, are are trained to take images and and have some basic training or perhaps reading and interpreting images, but nowhere near um, retinal specialists or ophthalmologist level. And so, what the AI solution is doing is providing that kind of expert level care, and that's where it helps to enable with task shifting or to be able to up-level some of these nurses and being able to interpret images, which they may not have been able to do as well on their own. Yeah, so that was just a tangent of like a sort of a side observation that was very interesting. Great, thank you so much. Uh, are there any other points that you'd like to make in our last few minutes? And our listeners, if you have any final questions, feel free to add that to the Q&A. No, just... Thank you for the opportunity to, to to let us talk here, and and uh, we really enjoyed it, and and great set of questions. I think those were very interesting, and and it seems like a very engaging audience. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank well, you. Thank everyone. you all so much. Yes, all of our audience, I would be thanking you if they <laughs> we were in a room giving a round. Uh, us. As you saw in the comments, there were many thanks. So thank you all very much, particularly for joining early in the morning there for our speakers from Singapore and for our guests in Asia and Sunny. Thank you all very much. An example of the importance of public and private sector working on these important issues for some of the more vulnerable across the world. Uh, so thank you very much again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing many of you in future seminars in our series. Thank you to our speakers. <laughs>